For Unit 6, we'll start with identifying atoms, cations, anions, molecules, and formula units. Chemical formulas are used to show the kinds and numbers of atoms of each element in the smallest representative unit of a substance. For example, the carbon dioxide that we breathe out and that trees absorb, all the way down to just one unit of that compound would be CO2, one carbon bonded with two oxygens. Mg3 PO42 is called magnesium phosphate, commonly used in medications to help with muscle relaxation, and one unit of that, or one formula unit of that, is made up of three magnesiums and two sets of one phosphorus with four oxygens, or two sets of PO4. And then hydrogen gas, one unit of hydrogen gas would be one molecule of H2. There are two types of chemical formulas. One is molecular, or also known as covalent compounds, which is nonmetals attached to other nonmetals. For example, CH4, carbon's a nonmetal, hydrogen's a nonmetal, and this would be a carbon with four hydrogens surrounding it. And then H2O, commonly known as water, has oxygen with two hydrogens connected to it. All of these are nonmetals, therefore these are covalent compounds. A molecule is the smallest electrically neutral unit of a substance that still has the properties of the substance. Molecules are made of two or more nonmetals that combine together and act as one unit. Diatomic molecules are made up of two of the same atoms. So there are seven elements that only exist in pairs. Those are oxygen, gas, iodine, hydrogen gas, bromine liquid, nitrogen gas, fluorine gas, and chlorine gas. The second type of compound are ionic compounds, which are a metal combined with a non-metal. For example, sodium and chlorine together make sodium chloride, which is table salt. Sodium is an alkali metal, chlorine is halogen. And potassium oxide, which is made up of an alkali metal and oxygen gas. A formula unit is used to describe ionic compounds. They are the smallest electrically neutral unit of an ionic compound that still has the properties of the substance. These are a combination of two or more ions. Metals lose electrons to form positive ions called cations. Nonmetals gain electrons to form negative ions called anions. So let's label each compound below as either ionic or molecular. First, chromium and sulfur. Chromium is found here in the transition metals, and sulfur is found here in the nonmetals. Remember, we have the staircase that divides the metals and nonmetals. So since we have one element from the left side of the staircase, a metal, combined with an element on the right side of the staircase, a nonmetal, that makes this ionic. Number two, zinc and chloride. Zinc is found here on the left side of the staircase. I'm just going to draw a rough line. And then chlorine is found here on the right side. This is a metal and a nonmetal, therefore, it's an ionic compound. Number three is sulfur and chlorine. Here is my dividing line, roughly, for the metals on the left side, nonmetals on the right. And we have sulfur, which is here combined with chlorine, which is also on this side of the staircase. And so because these are two nonmetals, this is going to be molecular or covalent. Next is PF5. Here is phosphorus and here is fluorine. And because both of these are nonmetals, that makes this compound molecular. Now we have calcium, which is here. And then we have something called phosphate which is a combination of two or more nonmetals that overall have a charge. So we have phosphorus and oxygen, both of which are on this side of the staircase. But since we have a metal with nonmetals, that makes this an ionic compound. Finally, we have carbons and hydrogens. Carbon is here on the right side of the staircase. And though hydrogen is on the left side of the staircase, it's not a metal. It's a nonmetal because hydrogen exists as a gas. So because both of these are nonmetals, that means that combined they are a molecular or covalent compound. So let's compare ionic to covalent compounds. First, if it's ionic, it's a metal and a nonmetal. If it's covalent, it's two or more nonmetals. 
If it's ionic, it's called a formula unit, which is the smallest particle of an ionic compound. If it's covalent, it's called a molecule as the smallest particle of that compound. If it's ionic, it exists as crystalline solids. If it's covalent, it tends to be liquids and gases. If it's ionic, there are cations and anions, and if it's covalent, there are no ions. Now we're gonna color the seven diatomic elements on the periodic table below, and there's a trick to this. We're gonna start at element number seven, which is nitrogen. We're gonna draw a seven. So from nitrogen, it's gonna be NOF, and then CLBRI, and see how that draws the number seven? And then we have seven elements, so the seventh element is going to be hydrogen. So the way we can think about this is start at seven, make a seven, hydrogen is the seventh element, which we have here. So now write the names and formulas for each diatomic element. So here's N, that's nitrogen, and its formula would be N2. Then we have O, oxygen is not gonna just be O, it's gonna be O2, followed by fluorine is gonna be F2, and then the rest of the halogens, Cl, Br, and I, will be chlorine, bromine, and iodine, Cl2, Br2, and I2, and then finally, the hydrogen is going to be H2. Now let's talk about ions. It's atoms or groups of atoms with a charge. Ions form when an atom loses or gains electrons. For example, sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons when it's neutral, if sodium were to lose one of its electrons, then it's going to have 11 protons and only 10 electrons, which now makes it not neutral and have an overall charge of positive one. So the octet rule states that atoms will gain, lose, or share electrons in order to achieve a noble gas configuration to be stable. The goal is to have eight valence electrons. Neutral oxygen has an atomic number of eight with eight protons and eight electrons. And so here you can see eight protons, positive eight, and negative eight is eight electrons. And when you add these together, you get zero, a neutral charge. If we look at the Bohr model, oxygen has six valence electrons. And since all atoms want an octet, like a noble gas, it would tend to gain two electrons in its valence to have eight on its outer energy level. But by gaining two electrons, now we have eight protons in the nucleus, 10 electrons around the atom, and when you add these numbers together, you get an overall negative two charge. So oxygen tends to form an anion with a charge of negative two. Another example would be aluminum, which has an atomic number of 13. So it has 13 protons and 13 electrons, and in that state it is neutral. If you look at the Bohr model, losing one, two, three electrons would get rid of that outer energy level, and then the one underneath that is full with two, four, six, eight becomes revealed. The loss of three electrons gives us 13 protons and 10 electrons, and when you add these together, we get a cation with a plus three charge. So there are two types of ions. Monoatomic ions, which consist of only one atom. The group number on the periodic table will tell you the number of valence electrons for each element, and from there you can determine the charge of the ions based on the element's location on the periodic table. Groups 1A, 2A, and 3A, alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, and the boron family will tend to lose one, two, and three electrons and become plus one, plus two, and plus three cations. For nonmetals, they're usually groups five, six, and seven, which is gonna be the nitrogen family, oxygen family, and halogens. They'll tend to gain three, two, and one electrons and become negative three, negative two, and negative one anions. Group four can lose or gain electrons and become plus or minus four ions. Metals would tend to lose four uh, and become plus four. Non-metals would tend to gain four and become negative four. And group eight already has a full octet and so they don't need to form any bonds. Transition metals have more than one oxidation state. For example, iron could be Fe with a plus two charge or Fe with a plus three charge 
And so we denote this with a Roman numeral. Iron Roman numeral 2 means Fe has a plus 2. Iron Roman numeral 3 means your Fe has a plus 3. Similarly, if you have copper Roman numeral 1, then it's a copper with a plus 1 charge. Copper Roman numeral 2 is a copper with a plus 2 charge. Some exceptions are these transition metals below, which always have the same charge. So silver has no Roman numeral. It only has one charge, a plus one. Cadmium only exists as plus two, and zinc only exists as plus two as well. These three you would have to memorize. When we name cations, we use the full name of the metal and then add the word cation or ion to the end. For example, if you had Ca plus two, it's calcium, but it's not just calcium neutral, it's calcium with a plus two charge, so we'll call it the calcium cation or the calcium ion. When we name anions, on the other hand, we actually change the root of the element name to have a suffix of ide, I-D-E. So if you have oxygen, but it has a negative two charge, then we're not going to call it oxygen anymore. It's going to be called oxide or the oxide anion or the oxide ion, but just oxide is fine. So group one, the alkali metals will tend to have a positive one charge. So if you have any of these in their ion form or cation form, then it's going to be H plus 1, Li plus 1, Na plus 1, K plus 1, Rb plus 1, Cs plus 1. The alkaline earth metals will tend to form a positive 2 charge, and so if they do that, it would be Be with a plus 2, Mg plus 2, Ca plus 2, Sr plus 2, Ba plus 2. Remember, we're just going to use their regular normal names. So K plus 1, for example, would just be called the potassium ion. Group 3 will tend to become a positive 3 charge, and usually we only use aluminum from this family, so it would be Al plus 3. Notice down below I have highlighted these transition metals. Remember most transition metals have a Roman numeral that tells us the charge, but these three do not. And so we're going to want to memorize these charges. Notice how they kind of make a step ladder. One step and then this is the second step up here. And so I've put these little charges to drop down. Silver would be plus one. Cadmium would be plus two and zinc would be plus two as well. So these three, you need to memorize their charges because they won't have a Roman numeral to tell you their charge. Now let's focus on the anions of the periodic table. So these are the groups that tend to become negative. The nitrogen family becomes negative three, oxygen family negative two, and the halogens a negative one. These names would change to have a suffix of "-ied". So if we have N negative three, that's going to be called nitride. P with a negative 3 is going to be called phosphide. O with a negative 2, oxide. S with a negative 2, sulfide. SE with a negative 2, selenide. F with a negative 1, fluoride. CL minus 1, chloride. BR minus 1, bromide. And I minus 1, iodide. Now we'll practice writing the symbols for the following ions using the charge pattern from the periodic table. So calcium ion. Calcium is here and it's in the group that tends to become a positive two charge and so we would write Ca with a plus two. The aluminum ion, we'll find aluminum on the periodic table is here. It's in the group that tends to become a positive three charge and so it will be Al plus three. The lithium ion, lithium is found here in the group first group, which will tend to have a positive one charge, and so we'll write Li plus one. Oxide is a nonmetal, which is found here, and this family tends to become a negative two charge, and so oxide would be written as O negative two. The cobalt Roman numeral two ion, the Roman numeral tells you the charge. The symbol for cobalt is here. It's in the transition metal, so we don't know a charge, but the Roman numeral tells us the charge. So it's gonna be CO with a plus two charge. Bromide, the ide kind of tells you that it's over here in the non-metal zone. So here's Br, bromide, and it's in the halogen family, which tends to get a negative one charge. So this is gonna be Br minus one. Nitride. 
Ide means it's in the nonmetals. So here is nitrogen or nitride. It's in the family that tends to get a negative three charge. So this will be in negative three. The silver ion, that's gonna be one of the ones that you have to memorize. So if you recall, we have the step ladder here. This is the first step of the ladder. So silver is gonna have a plus one charge and this is the second step of the ladder. So these two would have a plus two charge. So the silver ion is Ag plus one. And then the cadmium ion is here and that's gonna be a charge of plus two. And put pluses here to indicate the charges. So Mg plus two, since it's a positive charge, we're just gonna write out the name of the element like normal and then call it an ion, the magnesium ion. Next is S negative two. Because it's a negative charge, sulfur is gonna have to get a suffix of ide. So it's gonna be sulfide is the name of this ion. Na plus one, because it's a positive ion, we're just gonna name the metal sodium and then write ion at the end. Cl negative one, because it's a negative charge, we're gonna change it to have a suffix of ide, I-D-E. So this will be chloride. P negative three. P is normally phosphorus, but now that it has a negative charge, it's gonna be called phosphide. Zn plus two. Positive charge ions are gonna just be the same name of the metal and then ion at the end, zinc ion. Nickel plus three is just gonna be nickel, which is the name of the metal, because it's a transition metal, I'm gonna to have to put a parenthesis and give the Roman numeral to indicate it has a charge of plus three. If you recall, zinc is one of the transition metals, but it's one of the three that we're supposed to memorize because it only has one charge possible. The second type of ion is called a polyatomic ion. It's a tightly bound group of atoms with a charge. The names of most polyatomic ions end in eight or eight. The eight means there's one less oxygen than the eight. For example, sulfate is SO4 with a negative two charge, but if it becomes sulfite, I, instead of A, well now, instead of SO4, it's SO3, but they both still have a negative two charge. Nitrate, N-A-T-E, is gonna be NO3 negative one, but if we change it to nitrite, then the three becomes a two, NO2, negative one. Exactly the same, just one less oxygen. So here's a list of ions that you're gonna be asked to memorize, and in another video, we'll talk about tricks and ways to memorize these ions. You should be aware of the differences in the functions of superscripts versus subscripts. So these superscripts, which should be plus three and minus two, are the charges of these different ions, whereas the subscripts are gonna represent the quantity of each ion in the formula. For example, this being a subscript of three tells us we have three aluminum ions, and this subscript of two tells us we have two sets of sulfate ions, which is what the SO4 is.